thank you for inviting me. I am a relative newbie and I admit that I'm very obsessive and gung-ho. <laughs> when I find something I love, I try to learn as much as I possibly can. And I bring everything in my history to that effort. And I, I just wanna say at the beginning and at the end, the Bay Area bird photographers have been so generous in sharing information with me. When I first, I took my first little bird picture, there was uh, baby owls in natural bridges, which is right near my home. And I, I thought, this is so incredible. I went every day at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., 6 a.m., 6 p.m. to watch those little baby owls grow up in 2020. It was in May of 2020. And then I met somebody at the owls. And then I, I went to the Arboretum and I met somebody that was a Bayer photographer at the Arboretum. And they said, oh, you know, you should go out and see, you know, I, I think I told somebody that I was interested in seeing uh, black skimmers. And they said, you know, I'm going to go to Florida. I, I, maybe I'll see some black skimmers. They go, why go to Florida? There's black skimmers at Shoreline right near Intel. You know, <laughs> So I, I would learn the sites and I began to go and I realized there's a, a fantastic cohort of people who have been watching the cycles of the year for so many years and they understand the behaviors and where the birds are. So this is what I'd like to present. This is what I've learned over the two years and what I'm working on and what I'm very excited about. The first thing, can you hear? Is everything all right? The first thing I wanna talk about is the intentionality you bring to your photography. Um, it's really, it really helps form your artistry and also your focus to know what your intention is. Like I see, um, I just ran into a bird photographer that was doing a big year in California. Her intention is to just get a shot of the bird and leave as fast as possible. Um, I had to investigate what really my intentions were, what my goals were. Um, I found I wasn't really interested in documentation. I was interested in behavior, flight, and form, color. And so as when I go to a site, I'm trying to think all the time, how can I meet my goals? How can I optimize this shot so that I can get the beauty? In this particular shot of this Pintel Wida, I had like 15 minutes to go to the park where this wida was, I was told by other birders, and usually they're up in these sycamore trees and it's a terrible shot, you know, we're shooting up to the sky. And I saw this little bird go down to the ground and I got down on the ground. And I just thought, well, please come down again. And sure enough, came down and flew right over me. And I got this wonderful shot of the light going through its wings instead of the tree. So I was very pleased with that. The other thing I found that's so useful at a site is to, sometimes you see the bird and you see the environment and sometimes the bird's feeding off a certain particular leaf or tree or bug or something, but sometimes they're just feeding over flowers. This is a variable sunbird. I took it in Tanzania this year in February and it was feeding on these really complicated looking bushes that had a really busy background. And I saw this yellow flower and I thought, oh, you know, I'd love to see that sunbird on that flower. And of course I was with a couple of other people and I said, you know, are you willing to wait and see if the sunbird goes to that flower? And they said, yeah, oh, yeah, all right. And 20 minutes later, the sunbird alit on this flower and I was able to get this shot. And I just, I was exhilarated by that. Also, this is just a really normal scrub jay at the Arboretum right near my house, but I wanted to see it on the Banksia. And so I just waited and then it alit and it, I moved myself to try to find a really dark background. That's sometimes, once I get a shot of the bird, I'm like, how can I optimize it? How can I make the background right? How can I get the light just right? So moving around and just really having an intention of wanting that really very sedate, uncomplicated background. This is uh, also something that happens at the Arboretum. This is not a great shot in my opinion. Um, 
but this eucalyptus, unusual weeping eucalyptus blooms at a certain time of the year. And I just wanted to see the hummers on that. And of course, every time I came, it was really a sunny day with lots of shadows. So this picture is not the best, but I wanted the bird on that particular eucalyptus flower and I just waited for it to happen. And that's sometimes what has to happen at a, at a site. You could be waiting all day for a special thing to happen, but for me, I really like to understand what I'm waiting for and visualize it happening. Then developing a personal style, like I've been looking at other people's photographs and I would say that of the people I look at a lot, I can tell who it is, even though we all went to the same place, we all were shooting the same bird, we were cheek by jowl, 40 of us, you know, this incredible owl or something. Everybody has a style and I'm beginning to understand what my personal style is. I'm very influenced by Japanese brushwork and I, I brought these things to show you. These are pieces of pottery that I made in the 70s. I have an undergraduate degree in art and ceramics, and I was very interested in Japanese ceramics and Japanese brushwork. And so these are pieces that I made in probably in like 1973. And then after I made ceramics, I started making cloisonne enamel. And you can also see, you know, the influence of brushwork on, on both my ceramics and my enamel. So I try to bring that into my photography as well. Line, color, gesture, and that, that elegance of that particular, particular culture that I adore so much. And I find in my own photography, I'm quite tolerant of very dark photos. I, I think I rather like it. I love, I wake up at dawn. I love getting out of the house before it's light and um, finding what it looks like in the dark when the sun really even hasn't come up. And so that's part of my, I think, personal style. And then having to learn to work in low light. Um, you know, I was lucky because my very first camera that I got in, I think in 2019 was a Sony A9. And I only bought that camera because I saw a woman, I have dogs. I saw a woman taking pictures of dogs and every, when they were in the water, every little water drop was in perfect focus. And I thought, oh, I want to be able to take pictures of my dogs that look like that. And then my husband, he rused the day that he told me, you can buy something at B&H and spend a year paying it off interest free. <laughs> so I bought the A9 and it all, and somebody showed me a bird and I was on my way. But um, I'm lucky enough to have a camera where I, I have to pay attention to the ISO, but not the way people had to maybe 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to shoot in low light conditions. And I, I love dark conditions. One of the things that, you know, everyone I think kind of knows this, but for me, it's very important to have the lines of the photo lead to the bird's eyes and then to highlight the eyes by lightening them and bringing up the color and even maybe dimming and, um, pulling the attention away from things that are in the background that would be distracting from the lines of the bird and the eyes of the bird. Waiting for the bird to approach a perch is also one of my, my favorite things to do. In, in this is in Watsonville at the slough in Watsonville where there's this wonderful osprey nest and this perch that this osprey is on used to be a tree with branches. And I think the osprey used to use it all the time. After they um, caught a fish, they would clean their claws and then they would go to this perch. Right now, it's just this little snag and the osprey very infrequently come to that perch. But I, I'm always sitting there thinking, please, please go to that perch because it's a lot closer than the nest and it's at eye level. This is the perch the osprey is using for feeding much more. And that, and this is very far away. So this picture is very heavily cropped. And I think 
you know, the technical aspect of it isn't as good. But one of the things that is, for me, a huge priority is having a lot of detail in the feathers. And I still was able to achieve it. And this is something that I found out about my own equipment too. I have a teleconverter, which can get me a lot closer. So especially at the Osprey nest, I, I take a lot of shots with the naked lens. I take a lot of shots with the teleconverter and I come home and compare. And this is the naked lens cropped quite a lot. And the same shot with the teleconverter, similar shots don't have the fine detail of the feathers that this one does. So knowing what it is you really, really want, feather detail is one of the most important things. And of course, I like to get close for that, but it's not always possible. Again, waiting for the bird to come to the perch and trying to capture that moment. And it's it's often helped if you can find a place where there isn't a distracting background, there's nothing else for your camera to grab. And waiting for the uncluttered shot. I mean, many of us in the Bay Area now have been engaged in looking for warblers and shooting warblers and having the joy of having birds arrive that don't really normally aren't found in our environment. And being able to gather them, I mean, I saw someone in Santa Cruz that was a county birder, and he was getting the worm-eating warbler, and he'd never gotten in Santa Cruz County, and we had it for like six days. So he just he came from Stockton or something, and he had a little chair, and he was just going to wait till he saw that warbler. So that's great. But even that with warblers, it's very hard sometimes to get the uncluttered background. So just hoping and waiting for that something to happen where you can get the bird isolated from the branches. This bird is also a very heavy crop. This is a three-toed woodpecker that's a pretty rare bird, not, not easily found, and he was very high on the tree. And of the group that was waiting for this bird, we waited an hour for that bird to appear and to be able to get a shot. And this is a harrier it's an African harrier in Tanzania, also on a great perch. This is a predetermined artificial perch, which a lot of people in the Bay Area do too, and it's very fun. This is a workshop that I did with Alan Murphy, and I don't know how many of you know of him or follow his work. He's a very good photographer. He's an excellent, excellent birder. I mean, he will stand in an area and he can hear every bird that's, that's audible at all. And um, he'll tell you what it is and where it is. So these were these beautiful mountain bluebirds. And he drives around with perches in his car. And he goes, you want that on a perch? And he knows exactly where to place the perch. Like the bird's going from the ground to its nesting box, in this case, in, in this one road in Canada, there's nesting boxes where there's mountain bluebirds every like kind of half a mile. Um, it was a coal mining area and the coal miners, you know, put up these boxes in, in they gifted these boxes to the region in exchange for being able to do some mining there or something. Not, I made the joke, I go, oh, I thought coal miners used canaries, not mountain bluebirds. But um, you can see this exquisite perch. And this is one of our group of people in the Bay Area set up these flowers and had little worms on them. And we were able to get the mountain bluebirds um, on those, I mean, the Western bluebirds. So um, on artificial perches, that can be quite lovely. And this is a, also an unusual perch. This is a falconer, but I like to leave the, the perch in. And another great natural perch. This is a marsh wren singing, singing, singing on a cattail. And a yellow-headed blackbird also on a cattail in the same marsh. Um, Alan Murphy says, if you see a bird singing, try to get the inside of its throat. So that's what I was aiming for here. 
And then the beauty of man-made perches. Some, some people, they'll, I'll never take a bird on a man-made perch, but we often see this, of course, red-tailed hawks, uh, red-shouldered hawks, owls, uh, kestrels and things utilize the fencing that we have around, you know, around properties and it can be quite exquisite. And uh, wonderful branches in Florida. And then your, your not so exquisite perch. But um, because the, it's a long-eared owl that was friendly and graced us with her presence for so many days, uh, we had to take the perch with it. Lovely examples of birds in their environment. And then the kind of light. Again, I like dark light, I like side light experimenting with all kinds of kind, kind of light, always hoping to get the catch light in the eye of the bird. And then being aware of my own particular color palette. Um, I tend to like reds and oranges, and um, it's nice if you can get them with a complementary background color. Portraits of birds is something I adore, especially if you're lucky enough to get the bird up close and be able to have the feather detail. And I was so surprised when I found these um, grebes that have this bizarre, incredibly bizarre pupil. These were taken in Canada. And in order to get these grebes, we had to put on waders, get down in the water and, um, it was an Alan Murphy workshop and he threw blinds over us and I was like shivering in the water, but it was worth it to get these incredible greaves. You can see the unusual quality of their pupils. This is Booster. I, I'm kind of late to the party of coming to the Milpitas Eagles that are at Kirtner Elementary School. And I didn't see any babies last year, but I was able to watch this baby grow up. This is uh, this year's baby crop. And um, so wonderful to have certain exquisite experiences where the birds are friendly enough for you to become really intimate with them. And then I like to I, I find, I don't know if this is because my eyesight isn't really that great, but I like to crop really close so that you get that intimate view. And again, the lines always leading up to the eye and the feather detail. And these were these young owls at Natural Bridges. I watched them from the time they were just very, just first visible in their tree to when they started branching. They had a difficult time branching because they were in like the fork of a tree and they had, there was really nowhere, they were almost stuck, they couldn't get out. So they stayed in the nest a lot longer than, you know, the birders that were used to watching them and, and knew the timeline. But when they came out, they found this terrific tree next door and every evening you could see them wake up and, and come alive. And I love the contrast of the cone with the feather detail of the owl. Egrets and herons are also something that I love shooting and they're just such a common bird. And, you know, they are really gorgeous and we kind of take them for granted. But this was a day that I was going to the Kestrel that was at um, Sandy Wool. And this, the kestrel wasn't really showing up, but this beautiful egret was there. And I spent, I don't know, an hour and a half shooting just this bird, waiting for the feathers to come up in the wind and for the light to be just right. And I love the way the lichen picks up the orange of his bill. And finding that exquisite and adorable expression that some birds have, like these Allen hummingbirds, they have so much personality. And uh, they always, certain time of year, they come to the Arboretum right near me and I make sure to go there almost every day to catch them because they're such little clowns sticking out their tongues. And uh, more, you know, I was, I maneuvered myself around. I was hoping that the owl, again, I'm thinking, owl, please get near the pine cone. 
So my love of portraiture, I climbed up to pinnacles with a friend of mine. We we're both slow hikers. It's a mile, I think a mile and eight tenths of a mile, almost two miles up to the top of pinnacles. And I just was hand holding all my equipment and huffing and puffing. It took a long time to get up there. No condors. I mean, yeah, really distant in the fly flying around. And, oh, well, that's the way it is. And then we started down and boom, boom, boom. Three condors came and settled like right in front of us. And my friend was interested in flight and I'm interested in portraiture. So I got these, I just love this portrait so much. I thought these condors were maybe getting ready to mate, but then a bunch of more condors came in and they kind of lost interest. But I even like that the bird's membrane is over the pupil. It's just to me such a nice intimate picture. Some of you don't see that often. And I also like that their tags are on them. You can look up the condors, you can go on the condor page and you can find out exactly the name of your condor, the age and where it was hatched. So I love that. I, I, I had people tell me, oh, I just hate those tags. No, I love the tags. Because the condors were of course very close to extinction. Here's another portrait. This is taken from a blind and, um, but it is cropped, but so lucky to see this crested cara cara up close and to be able to just see every pore on its face. Just a wonderful experience. This is a um, little Cooper's hawk. And at the place where the white-tailed kites almost always came to Spring Valley, we didn't have a very good showing this year, Last year, we were graced with five Cooper Hawk babies. So I try to come every morning. I, I usually can't go places in the evening, but in the morning I can go. And I was so happy to find those young hawks every day and their expression. This is a barn owl that belongs to a falconer. And um, one of my some of my favorite pictures, I don't think they're in here, of, is of the predecessor of this one. Um, my friend had this wonderful barn owl, but eventually um, I think it, it got killed by another bird. So this is his brand new baby barn owl. This one is, I think only about a year old, but it's, it's wonderful. You never you would be able to really get quite this close in the wild. I still enjoy it. Pelicans. Also, I noticed that these two pelicans were grooming themselves on this rock. And I just thought, I'm gonna wait here and just only take these two, even though it's a whole rock full of pelicans flying in and out, waiting for them to, you know, assume a position that I thought was just magnificent. So I'm very happy with, with these guys. Here's Booster again, playing with plants. And here he is again, you know, he's on this soccer field of the school ground. I try to a little bit cover up the fact that he's on grass. <laughs> again, booster. And again, eating. My just joy in getting that close up where you can see the tips of the feathers. This is the mother owl from Natural Bridges. And this picture was taken when I was ready to go home. The sun had long gone away. And all of a sudden she flew in very, very close to a, a dead snag that was really near us. Um, I think she was finished hunting for the night and she was shaking all over. And I don't even know I don't know what the ISO is on this picture, but it's very high. It could be the highest. It could be 128,000. I'm not sure. But um, the one thing I found that's very useful, because I used to miss shots all the time, is having buttons on your camera, having presets on your camera. So I have a perching button. I have a very small um, a perching setting on one of my uh buttons on the back of my camera. I usually leave my shutter at the fast 
flight, you know, whatever the shutter speed I think would be appropriate for the flight of that particular bird. And I have in my mind shutter speeds for different kinds of birds. Like osprey are pretty slow, eagles are pretty slow, pelicans are quite slow, and then peregrines, obviously really quick. Um, so I, I have in my mind the, the shutter speed that I prefer for the bird, and then I adjust it according to how much light I have. So luckily this bird flew in and I had my perching button, but my perching button is at one over 500. But I was so delighted that I was able to get anything out of the shot because it was really pitch black at this time. Another one, and you can see the noise in the background, which I probably should try to manipulate out of there. <laughs> and the babies after the sun goes down. Always looking again to highlight their eyes. This is a mandarin duck in Southern California. And I just love the Japanese kimono effect of its feathers when it's folded in bathing. And uh, almost becomes an abstract. These are elegant turns that have this really specific feeding behavior. And these were at Moss Landing this year, just a couple months ago. And I don't remember them being at Moss Landing, elegant turns at Moss Landing in previous years. But since this is only my second year, I, I really don't know what I'm talking about in a way as to what's happened in previous years. So this was also, this picture is also taken before the sun came up and I was really low to the ground. I like to be low to the ground. I'm shooting birds on water. And I saw this unusual behavior of like, tick, 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 tick. and so I'm just snap, 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 snap. It wasn't until I really got home that I realized I had caught a feeding. So the young babies, I don't know if they do this to distinguish themselves from the other babies, but they fly it under the water. So the only way to catch this, because it's a very momentary thing, is either to, if you watch an adult bird flying around with um, a fish in its mouth, you can see where it goes, or sometimes you'll see a baby fly out to the water and then you can just keep your camera on the baby and wait for the mother to come. Or the, I don't know if it's a mother, if both parents feed. Another shot of the same thing. And you can see it's, it's quite dark. There's a lot of post-processing in this to bring up the light that was barely there. Again, shooting low on the water so you get that nice reflection, but also the uncluttered background. And this, I don't know how many of you were lucky enough to go and see these long-eared owl that was at Coyote Hills in Fremont. But this was, I think, probably one of the highlights of my, you know, short period of time of photographing. This bird was so friendly and was so consistent in her showing up and going to perches and was so tolerant of people being around. And I know there was a controversy about how close are you to the bird and are you preventing this bird from hunting and are you disturbing the bird? And I think people were mostly trying to be pretty considerate, but um, the park put up this orange fencing to keep people out of the field itself. And then she just like flew up and would perch right on the orange fence, right? One time I was there, right on the road. One time I was there, there were a bunch of people on the road and she flew between us, like flying down a gauntlet. And I actually felt her touch my leg. So she had her choice and she was choosing to be just the most wonderful object for photography. These are baby loons in Canada. And um, this was also with Alan Murphy. He's gone to the same place maybe for a decade. And he has a kind of a pontoon boat that's absolutely silent. And this little small lake, this loon pair, and there's only one pair in each body of water. Um, 
they know him. So they push their babies right up to the boat. And if another loon flies over, the, the loon, the mother loon becomes really excited and angry and makes a huge eerie screaming sound. And what she'll often do is like push the babies up to the pontoon boat and then go swim around screaming and making sure she's clearing the area of every other loon. So he said, I want you to be able to see the baby loon opening up their mouth and getting the bug from the mother. And, you know, again, the attention, this is what you want. And sure enough, we spent the whole day, but we were able to get some shots of that. And then another passion, I think of many bird photographers is feeding, feeding the babies. feeding the family. I know Peter had the wonderful shot of the two babies grabbing onto a fish of the, um, I think it was a Western grebe, right? I don't think it was a Clark's grebe. And congratulations on your Audubon acknowledgement. Whoops. And these grebes that we have at Claro more feeding. This is one where the sun had come up and I love it, but not as much as the ones that happened, you know, when it was really too dark to get a good picture. And this was a day that I went, uh, once I noted that there was something I wanted, then I'll go every single day until the experience is extinguished. And this day I went and it was very foggy, there was no light at all. And I thought, I don't know if I'll even be able to see anything, but I just sat there and shot. And luckily I was able to bring something out of that. This is, um, I'm pretty sure it's a male, but I'm not hundred percent sure, but he's actually doing like a parading behavior. He has zero intention of giving that fish to this baby. He just paraded it back and forth for about 10 minutes. I was waiting for him to feed, but no. More baby loons. These loons had hatched two days before this picture was taken. And it's amazing that they can get in the water. They're fully capable of swimming around. They were on their mother's back, but they spent plenty of time in the water. And of all the times I went to see the baby owls, this was the only one night where I was able to really see the feeding. And again, the ISO of this picture is very high and the quality is not so high, but just such a thrill to see the baby being fed by its mother. These are Northern flickers also taken in Canada. And um, I sat and watched this, those birds are, I don't know if they were particularly skittish because they had babies, but any movement at all, and you weren't gonna see this. And I was standing um, with my tripod in a blind getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So the sun was, came out it was so hot. And I just tried not to move a muscle because I could see that the, I mean, I could see out of the top of the netting that the parent bird was coming to the top of this dead snag that the um, nest is in and looking around and then shh, coming down and feeding and leaving. And if you made any motion, um, it was not going to come. This is the female and this is the male. And they both, they both do the work of feeding the babies. This is natural bridges again. And, you know, if there's a baby, I'll stay for another hour <laughs> to see how much I can see of their behavior. I do have this baby uh, begging from its parent, but I liked it against the, just the paleness of the water beyond the rocks. These were the natural bridges babies while they were still in the fork of the tree. This is a very young burrowing owl. And you can see that it's quite early in the morning because the pupil is so enlarged. There's very little light. And I was 
happy that I even could focus on flight at this time. And uh, this little one has a bug and is approaching the perch. This was taken the year before and I think my technical abilities have really, I can see how much they've changed in one year because I would do something to get rid of the noise in this background because this was also taken just at the crack of dawn and you can see how large their pupils are because there really is almost no light. But luckily these particular burrowing owls in Ontario, they're near Ontario airport in Los Angeles are quite tolerant of people. These are my natural bridges birds. Again, always emphasizing the eyes and hoping for catch light and then using post-processing to bring the eye up even more. And this is a pretty young, I think just a few days hatched wood duck um, that was in Santa Cruz, wood duck check. This is your young peregrine falcons. And I don't know if anybody has had the pleasure of visiting the peregrine falcons in Los Angeles. I, I love going to Devil's Slide to watch the peregrine falcons and I'll go day after day to that. But um, because of my children live in Los Angeles, I am lucky enough to have a place to stay if I go down there. And this site that's pretty well known San Pedro, it's the very point of San Pedro at the end, at the bottom of highway, I think the 110 in Los Angeles. <clears throat> There's a, an artificial perch that birders have put in the cliff and for many years, a particular male and different females have raised a clutch of birds. So it's so great because the birds are again, very visible, very tolerant of humans and uh, beautiful shots of them. And this is one of the very first days that these birds were testing their wings. There were three. Early in the morning, but light enough to get pretty, pretty good feather detail. I can see the little pin feathers, oops, still here on the bird. And this is a very young burrowing owl, also early in the day. This, these were the kestrels this year at Sandy Bull Lake. And I wasn't able to get the definitive shot of them um, getting the dragonfly, but I went day after day after day. And finally one flew over with a dragonfly. So I was, I was happy with that. And this is your female hooded merganser with a little crayfish. Oh, more turns early in the day. And always interested in getting, you know, that shot that's going to bring some emotion, like the sort of sad look on the little fish as you see it's eyes appear to be looking up as it's, you know, having its probably last few little moments here with this snowy egret. I think it's, if you're able to insert that emotion that, that you can evoke something in the viewer, a feeling of, you know, empathy or joy or sadness, that's a very important aspect of photography to me. Here is another little green heron fishing. And this is, um, this is an interesting shot for me because usually I try to have that very uncomplicated um, background, but this was a pretty noisy background. So I worked hard to darken everything and only leave the light on the fish in the water and the bird's eye. Here's your papa burrowing owl bringing home food to the babies pretty early in the morning, but his pupils are already not as enlarged as the babies earlier on. 
again, Osprey eating. Female hooded merganser fleeing from others that might wanna take her prize. Also shot very low to the water. Osprey coming. This Osprey can be pretty annoying. He catches a fish. This is only a tiny fish, won't take him long, but he catches a fish and in full view of his family spends like an hour and 15 minutes eating it before he shares the tail with the mother and the babies that are in the nest. Flight is always so exciting to see. These were red-winged blackbirds in Canada. And I just, even though other things were going on, I was really hoping to get some decent flight shots of them. This was taken um, at Lodi just two weeks ago. Also pretty early on when the sun was just coming up. And this was taken a couple weeks ago. I love that I'm learning the tools of being able to take a shot that's pretty bad straight out of the camera and bringing the light in and being able to emphasize, you know, the transparency of the wings and so forth. And um, I'm, I'm constantly trying to teach myself new processing techniques and looking at other photographers to see what's happening. And I realized that um, I like things dark and not as colorful as most people, but I'm, I'm now starting to become appreciative of a little bit more color. This was um, the Northern Flicker at the same place where I showed you the babies and he's removing the fecal sac from the nest. Um, this is part of the chores of house cleaning. And these are the baby peregrine falcons when they've already learned to fly a lot better. They were doing beautiful dances in the sky, flying together. The long-eared owl again, hovering, um, hunting. This bird was an excellent hunter. I saw her get four bulls in just one morning. Again, the flight, always hoping for that wing position where you can see that, that arc of the wing. It usually happens in a change of direction. And you know, one of the things that I really appreciate, I've got, I don't live in Los Angeles, so I've only gone to this site five times where these burrowing owls are, but I'm very much more successful at capturing anything if I go to a site over and over and over. I begin to understand the flow, the direction of what's gonna happen. I begin to be able to anticipate it. And then I can use my intention to get the shot that I really want. <clears throat> In this particular, th not this shot, because this is one of the younger birds. But when I was sitting there, I noticed that the, the father bird would go up to the light post, which I wouldn't want to shoot on and you were shooting into the sky. Then he would go deep in the field and then he would get the beetle and fly straight back like the picture I showed with the, the father coming with the beetle back. And so what I did was I would just find where he went in the field and get the appropriate settings to sit right there so I could catch him all the way back. And it, it was pretty successful. I mean, once I understood what the flow was, I could repeat it and then I can, you know, have way more control over the shot that I was getting. Here are the condors again flying. I think this one is a female named Little Stinker. This is an auger buzzard, uh, not an uncommon bird in Africa. And all the birds are on these acacias with tons of thorns. So interesting, they're not bothered by it. The behavior of diving, hard to catch, um, really exciting when you do. Like I say, this was the same kestrel this year at Sandy Wool. I didn't get the great shot with the little dragonfly, but I was happy with this diving shot. 
and this was just taken at Point Reyes, very foggy day, so not, not as much feather detail and clarity as I like, but shooting the pelicans diving. Um, I went to Florida and I was shooting um, osprey diving and more people now are coming up with the wonderful shot with the talons extended. I still haven't gotten that shot, but it's on my list. Hunting behaviors, always fun to watch. Knowing the best time of day to come for that and being able to see how animals feed themselves. It's so exciting. That was a longer dowel and this, I think on the same day, it was a shorter dowel hunting the same field. Kingfishers hunting or fishing rather. And these are the elegant turns. They have that special way they're, they're of um, skimming the water almost like skimmers and making these beautiful splashes. I was dying to see the skimmers and I think that in previous years people got wonderful shots of black skimmers. I was only able to go in the morning and everyone else I think got really great shots at, at the golden hour at sunset. So I was there in the morning, it was almost pitch black and I could see this one little skimmer skimming. And then when I got home, I was delighted to see that it was a juvenile and I was able to lighten up the photo enough to get this kind of wonderful morning kind of painterly effect with this baby skimmer, probably just learning to skim. And this is a behavior I always treasure that Osprey, I mean, when they're first learning to fly, they just do a little trampoline where they jump up and down on the nest. They don't really go anywhere. And you can get these wonderful shots of them just jumping up and down. This is a behavior that I have not seen in California, although I probably wouldn't know where to go. Um, even though we see these ruddy ducks quite a lot, you can see them at Calero and other places too. I think sometimes you can see them in Sandy. Well, I know that I can see them in Santa Cruz, but these ruddy ducks in Canada were doing this mating behavior. Firstly, they stick their feathers up on their head and it almost looks like horns because normally their heads are smooth. And then they have this bladder of air in their throat and they beat their chest with their bill in rapid succession and they form this foam in front of them. And it's like, boom, 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 boom. And then they make this huge burp. And over and over and over, pounding their chest and then it's a very unusual and, and fun behavior to be able to witness. Of course, mating that we're lucky to see with the white tail kites. And um, this was in the Los Angeles Arboretum. I got there, I wasn't set up. I was about to get down on my knees and get as low as I could. And I saw this <laughs> flurry of activity and I'm just like, choo, 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 choo. And I was lucky enough to find uh, the mating behavior of these two. I actually didn't know what was happening until I looked at, it, you know, at, at the shots afterwards. And that's something that I think many of us do and I, I really advocated is shoot, 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 look, shoot, look, shoot, look, constantly looking and adjusting my settings and changing my strategies. Nest building more nest building. You're always hoping for a fish, but I'm, I'm somewhat equally happy to get the stick, especially I've learned now when I go to the osprey nest, try to go to a time where the wind is blowing towards the nest, then you're almost gonna get all the approaches to the nest will be with the wings outspread in the right position. If you're there when the wind is blowing the other way, you're just gonna get the butt shots every time. And I love this shot so much. Um, both the mandarin ducks, I'm sure it's probably true of most 
waterfall, they have fell, they have a way of bathing that becomes predictable when you watch it. So the loons do this preening, 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 preening. And then all of a sudden they stretch up and stretch their wings out. And it's so beautiful to see the patterns on the back of their, their wings and on their backs. Also the low shot and the very uncluttered background. These were cranes. Um, this was also just two weeks ago. I was lucky enough to get, it, this light was not the best, but then a cloud came over, so it wasn't so harsh because I love the variation in the, the blues and browns of their feathers. But I hadn't seen cranes do this before, and I don't exactly know what it is, but they were raising their heads in unison over and over and over. So this is definitely a behavior. I, I really should look it up to see exactly what it means. And um, this is the masked weaver in Tanzania. They build these exquisite nests out of fresh grass. The, this whole contraption was swinging. So when the bird hit it, it, it was swinging. So I was lucky to get clear shots because I wasn't really that close to this bird. But um, he'd hit that thing and then just grab, you know, and just beautifully weave in these fresh pieces of grass. Quite exquisite. These are sap suckers, and they're also demonstrating a behavior. One parent usually will be in the hole with the babies, and then when the parent, the other parent, I think it's the male on the outside and the female on the inside, comes with the food, then she'll exit and he'll come in. And once you see it and over and over and over, you think, oh, can I get that moment when she's coming out and he's going in? And uh, the hooded mergansers again, I don't usually see them fly. So I was so delighted to catch this one in flight. And also the, the preening and then the wing flapping. And now I'm starting to experiment a little bit with black and white. Here's the picture in color and here it is in black and white. And I think it's, it's more dramatic and perhaps more beautiful even in black and white. So some, some photographs I think lend themselves to this. You see that papery texture of the wings, which I love so much. And then always be ready. I mean, I made so many mistakes in the beginning because I wasn't ready. Like I was in a perching shutter speed and now something was happening that was quick. So now I've tried to optimize the settings on my camera and be familiar with them so I can switch from one to the other. But being aware of what the possibilities are and being ready to shoot at that moment really, really helps a lot. And it's something that shooting day after day, you get better at it. But I think it, it just, it's, it's the joy of being able to go out there and photograph birds and catch that moment that you're hoping for. So it's great to see three of the greaves rushing at one time. And this was, of all the days I went to the osprey nest, only two days was the female really protective of the babies and just going after anything that came anywhere near. So getting her attacking this pelican. And uh, the peregrine falcon, the fierce Mr. 2Z peregrine falcon at Point Furman in San Pedro, getting rid of anything that's in the area around his babies. It looks like he's kind of surfing on this uh, gull. And here he was, it looks like the uh, raven is attacking him, but he's really the, he's the one that's gonna prevail in this air fight. And I was um, at shoreline hoping to see the Sora, 
But all of a sudden this duck just made this wonderful pattern in the water. And that's why readiness is so important. Just trying to keep your eye on everything that's going on in a particular setting. These were um, red hornbills in Tanzania. And this was at the very end of the day. So these are also high ISO photographs. What these birds do is they go to the ground and they get a big pile of mud on their bill and they actually seal the babies into a hole in the tree. When they're really young, the father seals the mother in the hole as well. So they're completely sealed in. There's like a little hole where the father will feed the female and the babies. Lucky enough to see them go back to the mud and then back to the nest and back getting the mud and back to the nest. And something that I'm trying to teach myself to do, I'm so keen on portraiture that sometimes I miss the big picture. So I went back many, many times to try to get the moment when these elegant turns take off. I don't know if they if there's a predator, but they periodically about every 35 minutes or so, they'll, they'll all take off in a flock and then they'll all come back to the same place. But I was I happy to get the shot. And also recognizing that when I was waiting for this shot, this isn't such a good example, but I have other ones to change my aperture so that I would get a little bit more depth of focus because usually I'm shooting mostly wide open and that wouldn't be the greatest setting for a shot of a flock of birds. This beautiful lilac breasted roller in Tanzania about to take off. And this, I, I brought this to show you. This is the straight out of the camera of these birds. I, I know that baby owls have this behavior where they play with each other's feet and they, they kiss each other and everything. And I was started to see them get towards that. I thought they're gonna do it. They're gonna, they're gonna hold hands. They're gonna hold each other's hands. And sure enough, you know, I'm just visualizing, please hold hands. And then they did. So I was thrilled, but you can see the difference. There's the straight out of the camera and there's the finished picture. Um, and you know, I'm gonna probably work this one over a few times because I'm not so happy with the crop, but um, you can see that I've tried to minimize the brightness in the background to bring the birds forward and the birds eye forward. But sometimes it's nice to see, you know, what you can do with the, your post-processing. And here's another one where I showed you the straight out of the camera and the finished um, picture. What I loved so much about this was how those claws are evident on the cut piece of wood of this perch. But you can see that there are these, you see it in the other pictures of the long-eared owl, there's these fuzzy white flowers everywhere. And of course the perch was behind that. So I worked hard to bring out the detail in the, to kind of dehaze and emphasize the detail that was behind those flowers. And I was pretty happy that I was able to arrive at this. And then I made the light, the light, I want your eye to go here. And then I want your eye to go here so that you see those, those talons on the wood. So everything else I darkened in these two places, I hope will attract the eye. So that's the end of the presentation and I'm happy to take questions.